Hello, party people. Welcome to the lecture called The Classicists. As a discretionary note, it is not safe for work. <laughs> um, there are some, here's a rating. There's some suggestive dialogue about sex. There's definitely going to be some inappropriate imagery and there will be some violence <laughs> because we're talking about the Roman Empire here and <laughs> they were they were filthy, filthy animals <laughs> in a good way, I suppose. Um, not much has really changed and we are going to talk about that throughout the lecture because it seems like ancient times, but when we go through the things that they prioritized and um, how some of their spaces were set up, some of the things that they initiated in culture that are still predominantly used. There hasn't been much evolution since then. Um, and they're very much a part of contemporary uh, canon on historical preservation, um, but also globalization. So this lecture is really gonna focus on reviewing um, the Roman Empire, like what was it really? You know, where did it take place? What are some of the important happenings um, to just set the context? Um, and then we are going to move into how it impacts other cultures and the globalization. This is slightly different than the chapter. The chapter will really focus on um, very specific small design elements. So it will talk to you about the different styles of columns <laughs> and uh, different types of you know material patterns and sculptures. Um, and I do know you guys are required to take an art history and this information, more so than any other chapter in our book, is highly covered in art history classes. So I am going to assume that you are fully reading the text and this lecture is complementary to the text as opposed to simply a regurgitation. Um, so with that being said, if you have children in the room or um, listening ears, maybe somebody else can hear you and you don't want them to, you might want to pause now. Um, we're, I think we probably have a good few minutes before things start to get pretty dirty. <laughs> um, and uh, either listen to this when you, I almost said when you are alone, that sounds so bad, um, <laughs> or when you are, uh, you know, away from vulnerable ears. So anyway, this painting that we are seeing in front of us, um, this is a painting by Giovanni Paolo Panini. <laughs> Um, and it's basically, it's two things. So it is a painting that happened well after the classical Roman times. Um, but it is a really great image of how we view uh, Roman culture. So we do see um, Roman natives <laughs> um, engaging in Roman activities dressed appropriately. We see a whole, we see there is some courtship, there's some bathing, um, there's some bleeding and violence. There's a lot of different things happening here. Um, you see some of those classic sculptures. You see the columns and the Colosseum in the background. We are in Rome in this image. Um, but then in the foreground, we also, the, yeah, foreground, we also see um, ruins. So it almost transitions from Roman at the peak of their culture, and now we're also seeing ruins. And that's really how we view the Roman Empire today, especially when you are in Italy. And it, the Roman Empire is not specific to Italy or Greece. Um, in fact, it is a really large, large portion of Europe and parts of Asia in the Middle East and Africa. Um, and so we typically associate the Roman Empire with Italy and like the Colosseum. And um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about why that is and why other countries who had a really strong influence in the Roman Empire 
our, their identity isn't wrapped up in that anymore to the same extent that Italy is. So, but this painting specifically I found very interesting because um, I lived in Italy for a while and <laughs> I stood right where this was. Um, so I'm, I could be in the painting. I took this photograph. Um, this is my friend Michael, like buying selfie sticks from people on the street, selling them. He was the, he's the person that takes selfies in front of everything. So he's taking a selfie in front of the Colosseum. Um, but you can see the difference between that painting and uh, this image culturally. So we still see some of the landscape. You still see the trees and you see some of the village in the background, obviously in a deteriorated state, but still in use. Um, the Colosseum is now a museum. So in the background, you're seeing a lot of people waiting in line, but then people are walking around in the streets um, in a similar way that they were during Roman times before there were vehicles. So that is a part of culture that still happens today. Um, even though there are vehicles, it's almost as if they're not really acknowledged. And there's really not much um, like pedestrian automobile accidents because it's a part of, there's, there's um, pedestrians are more important and the culture of maintaining you know, the Roman culture is important. And so automobiles are almost secondary and they don't matter as much, which is um, drastically different than in our country today or in other countries. So I just, I thought the image was interesting because you're seeing, you know, Romans in the Colosseum at the height of their existence, plus some ruins. And then in the picture I took, it's like, a social media dystopian millennial I don't know it's um that's that's what it is today so who were the Romans and what did they give us we're gonna go through some of their contributions to society um, and these contributions are only associated with them because that's when they first became documented. So naturally, we historians, um, you know, date these things back to the Romans. Does not mean that these did not exist prior to that. They just weren't documented. Um, so the botany, um, they studied life. And we see the classification of animals. Um, and so there, Aristotle um, did that. And we see physics, civil engineering, um, columns. So Italy has always had a intimate relationship with water um, and irrigation. And so the Romans really um, started that and started thinking about plumbing, <laughs> believe it or not. It's not like modern day plumbing, but it's um, getting irrigation from a larger bodies of water into areas that they were maybe um, farming or places that like the bathhouses. So um, civil engineering was actually prompted based on the culture of water being really important to society. Um, similarly, columns are somewhat a civil engineering and an urban uh, sense, but also they became really important structural elements. Now I'm sure columns existed before that, they just, you know, they were vertical supports to hold something up. Um, <laughs> we see that in nature. <laughs> um, but they are now formally called columns and they're styles. It's a very strict styling of columns and they have uh, embedded symbolic meanings, which today is a bunch of bullshit, I'll say it. Um, knowing the different types of columns is really um, an old way of discussing design history. Um, so we are going to move on from that, but they did, they are associated and they did um, at least evolve like this high-end column design. They also, <laughs> the globe, they were also the ones who first, I wanna say discovered that the globe, the earth is circular, it's a globe. 
um, not that they had something that would go up to space and look down, um, but they studied the circadian rhythm and uh, the sun and the moon, and they um, started putting together some pieces with science. Um, and so they were the first ones to come out and say that the Earth is a globe, um, at least that we have documented. <laughs> um, they did, however, uh, discover and engineer the first odometer. So an odometer, those are, it's like our Fitbits today. <laughs> Think of this as like the first Fitbit. So it just, it measures distance. Um, so basically, if, you know, being that everything um, transportation-wise at the time was by foot or, you know, horse and carriage, um, if they wanted to tell distance, they would literally push this odometer, the distance that they needed to measure, and it would count in measurable increments. And so that's how they started um, being able to measure distance over time as well. So this was the first odometer. Um, in a similar way, because now we're measuring distance, uh, cartography was discovered, which, or discovered, which it was developed is the art of map making. Um, and it's more than just making maps, it's like really using them in a scientific way and sometimes creating maps just for specific things. Um, we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, they also invented the water mill and think about that. I, if um, anybody comes from a Dutch family or knows anything about the Netherlands, um, water mills are generally associated with um, the Netherlands, Holland, um, Dutch culture. Uh, and so <laughs> uh, everybody, you know, if you have European descent, um, you might have these like cultural heritage things that are associated with you. Like for instance, um, Germans like, I don't know, hide pickles at Christmas time. You know, there's just like a bunch of these small little things that um, we're always told are trickle back to like the European culture um, that still exist in our lives today. Um, I come from a Dutch family and so water mills and clogs and the even you can see they have like the special cloaks on their head. Um, that all, you know, I was told was very Dutch. Um, and that's not wrong. It's just that um, it happened during the Roman Empire where, du where um, the Netherlands is located. So a lot of the cultural heritage of each individual country, which did not exist at, during the time of the Roman Empire, um, it roots back to the Roman Empire. And not just that, it goes much, much further. There was actually an empire significantly larger and more dominating than the Roman Empire at the time, but it does not get discussed enough, in my opinion, because it is still a major player in today's world. Um, and it's pretty phenomenal how it's taken over the world. But they also discovered alarm clocks. So you can kind of put together like alarm clock, globe, cartography, odometer. We're seeing um, a measurement of time and space. They started uh, creating medicine in a very formalized way. So there were people that would study medicine and perform medicine as you know, doctors. They had therapeutic um, services that you could receive. Um, a, lot of <laughs> a lot of them were um, carried even into the Victorian times before uh, you know, what we call modern medicine occurred. That's how long their medicine um, lasted in society. They are known for the Olympics and really um, democracy, government in general. Of course, I had to put this, you know, we all know, we've all seen this before. It's the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it was created by Pythagoras. And there's a whole, whole host of mathematics that um, have come out of the Roman Empire. But I think that this is the most universal to us. Like, we instantly know it. Somebody says the Pythagorean theorem, you know it. It's, yeah, so. 
So going back to medicine, this is this is something. Now it's some of these medical procedures, <laughs> um, the way that they viewed it, um, is interesting. <laughs> so what you see here on the bottom of this page um, is a bed that is located in what we call a brothel, but at the time it was located in what they would call um, like a physical therapy treatment center. <laughs> um, literally same program, same you know layout, same overall concept, but the Romans um, you know didn't didn't view sex um, in the way that we do. It was a big part of their culture, and um, doctors were finding that sex therapy was really significant to their health. Um, and so you would find, there are still a lot of ruins that show, um, that's a bed right there, that's like an actual bed where things happened. Um, and this is on the top, this is an engraving that was found um, in similar ruins with beds. So they had like essentially like the menu of services <laughs> engraved in the stone walls. Um, and there uh, were a lot of different styles of therapy going on and none of it was seen as um, like dirty or like overtly sexual um, and it wasn't like submissive to women like in this photo you might think that she's kind of a sex slave or something but it really wasn't both um, sexes uh, received therapy and um, both sexes worked in these um, areas that was like someone's full-time job was um, a sex worker, <laughs> um, but it, it, they were actually like a medical, <laughs> a doctor, nurse type of um, job in society. That's what they were viewed as. So um, it's, an, it's just a really interesting part of the Roman culture. Um, and to that end, you also see spas and bathhouses um, being a huge part of the Roman Empire um, for very similar reasons. Um, so social interaction was a big part of the culture, but also bathing. Um, you know, they really used their water to centralize their social activities, which is smart for them since the resources um, of being able to bathe, a lot of people just didn't have that type of access to water in their houses. So they would often go to these bathhouses um, on a weekly basis if they were lucky, on a monthly basis if they were an average person, um, and then it would be a, like a good opportunity to socialize with people and catch up and was therapeutic in and of itself. So the spas and the bathhouses were, um, and I say they weren't called spas at the time, they were actually called bathhouses, um, but they were the first development of what we call a spa because people would also receive services. They would get massages, they would have more sex working going on, they would have doctors set up there. So it was um, kind of your area to work on your hygiene and you know work on your mental health um, and sort of like work on your appearance and all of that in a really fun way. So it was the original onset of this type of culture that we have documented. Um, and so in the bottom, in the top images are uh, depictions of what some of these areas look like. And in the bottom images, um, you see that there's a ruined state of bathhouses. So all over Europe, um, and a lot of them in Italy are these ruined, ruined bathhouses. So nobody has ever really done anything with them, um, and but they're like somewhat off limits, and people protest them. So on a daily basis, people will hold um, protests at these bathhouses, wanting a revitalization or maybe some social equity, but also because the water is untreated and whatever water is in there is just from rain, um, that mixed with runoff and ground contaminants 
Um, people die on a regular basis from entering the water in these pools, and it's really unsafe. They, they actually lose a lot of children in this way. You can imagine, like, if you were an Italian, a little Italian kid wanting to have a sleepover, wouldn't you sneak out and, like, go to a bathhouse? <laughs> um, <laughs> the ultimate night at the museum. But they die. Um, if, if they have like poison from the water. And so people are protesting this. The people in the water here actually did get in the water and simulated death um, as a way to speak to the government. Um, so there are uh, government officials that wanna tear these down because they're a uh, liability. There's so many of them too. So it's like, do we really need all of them? Like. We can preserve some of them, but can we just get rid of the rest? You know, it's like blight, like let's just clear it out. It's better to have empty land. And so people don't want that either. They, they wanna protect their past um, because they see it as a direct route to the future. So it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. Th these images in the bottom right hand corner are from a year ago. But we have bathhouses today. Um, obviously, we have spas, but today, this is how the bathhouse culture has come about. And these are just some notable bathhouses from around the world. And it's really interesting to see contemporary interpretation of Roman culture. And I'm not completely sure if people know that when they go to these um, locations, that they are engaging in Roman culture. So the uh, evolution of bathhouses in general is um, a really interesting thing. Um, I, I'm sure there are some locations where there's sex work that happens. Um, in fact, I do have, I think I have a slide coming up on, let me just make sure if I have it. Yes. I, later on down the road, we're gonna talk, <laughs> down the road, we're gonna talk more about the physical therapy and the medical aspect of culture. Um, but there is a bathhouse in Detroit. Some of you who are from Detroit might already know what I'm talking about. And um, it is known for its you know, function as a bathhouse, but as a spa, as a safe place for people to engage in sexual activity. Um, and different themed nights. So it's really interesting. Um, we'll talk about that soon. But the, this carrying on of like our therapeutic um, medicine overlap is, you know, we have a lot of like anti-science people in society and people that question authority and people that question medicine. And here we have, <laughs> his name is uh, Cato the Elder. So um, he, <laughs> he was somebody that was highly critical of the medical advancements of Roman society. He was a politician and he was renowned for his conservative morals. He had a son named Marcus and he wrote Marcus a letter that we still have today. Um, where he forbade Marcus from ever seeking medical help from a professional doctor because he believed that the practice by ethnic Greeks was nothing less than a conspiracy to destroy Rome. So for a while, like, ancient Greece and Rome have always been in um, you know, some kind of like competition with each other, but they're the exact same at the time. They just, um, it says ethnic Greeks, there's a slight difference in their skin color, um, but in terms of the Roman Empire, they're both at the height of the Roman Empire. But he is quoted as saying, Greek doctors have sworn to kill all barbarians with medicine, and they charge a fee for doing it in order to be trusted and to work more easily. I thought this was interesting um, because that quote honestly could have come from today. I could have seen this on social media about medicine today from people who qu are questioning it. Um, and the fact that he is a conservative politician, um, it's just a really, really <laughs> good example of how um, 
the human nature and the, the questioning of society advancements um, really stop some people in their tracks and they become scared by it and they become scared to move forward into it. So he did tell this to his son. Um, he wasn't like saying this about himself. He was old and he did not want his son to get involved in anything like that, you know, throughout his life. So let's talk a little bit more about the context. Um, you may have heard of Pompeii. It's probably one of the uh, most well-known Roman Empire events and locations. Um, Pompeii was a city in um, the Roman Empire, which is now like, um, you can see where in Italy it's located. Um, there's a little circle and it leads to a larger portal of land, which is what Pompeii became. Um, it originally was this little red area and it was settled as a village called Samnite. Um, but then throughout the years, like hundreds of years, it developed even more because the, you know, the climate was amazing. It had access to water. Um, wealthier people were going there because it was separated relatively from like the more urban areas, but it also wasn't um, like rural um, farming. And it became well known as a vacation town. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, I guess, sort of like um, our Palm Beach, <laughs> where it's this like high end celebrity vacation area, or like you hear rumors about things that happen at Palm Beach. Um, and so in the green is the third development. And then finally in the yellow is that's when um, it became Pompeii uh, and was fully assimilated with the Romans who were like, hey, these people know how to live. They're doing it right. Let's make this our vacation town. <laughs> um, so the Roman Empire happened um, in 100 BCE, and it lasted up until almost 1500 CE. And so um, I'm assuming for those who have taken art history, you have already been familiar, familiarized with um, BCE and CE. Uh, but you may have heard these otherwise be calling um, like BC and AD. Uh, it's the same thing. So BCE is before the Common Era, and then CE is Common Era. And so we no longer use BC and AD. Um, so just for context, because I know whenever I hear a date that's in BCE, <laughs> it's hard. It's like, how many years ago was that? Like, but really. <laughs> um, so the earliest was only 567 years ago. The Roman Empire lasted a really long time, um, uh, longer than we would ever think. Um, so the 567 years uh, was when um, the last, you know, the Roman Empire started fizzling out and uh, moving on because of other reasons, which we'll talk about in a later lecture. Um, but if you think about it, how many generations back of your family can you go? Um, you know, it, I know I can go back to the 1700s. Um, and how far away is that from the 1500s? Like only a few more, <laughs> a few more relatives. So it's, it feels like, and we call this ancient Rome. Um, it's not that ancient, <laughs> especially in the timeline of the entire world. Um, we're not that far removed in a timeline sense from the Roman Empire. And that is why there's so many um, remnants. We see it in ruins, which makes us think it was almost like primitive, but it actually was very much like the world we live in today. So um, everything in red was officially considered the Roman Empire. Um, and it's labeled, you know, appropriately to what we know it today. But at the time, um, none of that, you know, it didn't have the word Spain or Africa or Asia Minor. Um, they were different settlements. And 
as Rome, the Roman Empire expanded, any, any um, natives that were there already had to become assimilated, um, which is why, I don't know, um, when I think about this, um, in today's culture, uh, we have something called blackwashing. Um, and Ariana Grande is criticized highly of doing this, of like um, dressing and doing her hair and like talking in certain ways or like using black culture to promote herself even though she's not black. So a lot of people, um, you know, black fishing, black washing, but then there are people that stand up because she has like direct Italian roots, like she's almost full Italian. Um, and they're saying, hey, you know what? Like, she's Italian, and more, uh, there's more relationship to Italy in terms of like Africa than in any other area. So, Italians are basically um, mixtures, even though we see them um, as now European and white. Um, you will notice if you've been there that it does start like really pale and white at the top, but then as you go down and um, south, it does, people's skin tone does get darker and like more what we would call Mediterranean look. And that's why it's just because over all of that time, there has been that mixture. And Italy has a high level of racism because, um, you know, there's, <laughs> for the same reasons uh, there's like um, a competition or like stigma against light skin versus dark skin. Um, Italy is like doing that right now. Like it's a really, really difficult. Um, as you saw when I was there, I was with Michael, um, who's Nigerian <laughs> and has a very thick Nigerian accent and looks Nigerian from a mile away. <laughs> um, we had very, like it was very obvious that we were treated differently. Um, and I don't think it's because Nigerian versus American. I think it was white versus black, um, especially since uh, the fact that he's not African American, he's African and there's even more stigma directly towards Africa and any immigrants whatsoever in Italy. Their culture is very far right right now. Um, and so this is like sort of the roots and the reason why but let's talk more about Pompeii and um, vacation town, the Palm Beach of the Roman Empire. <laughs> um, so this is in the upper right-hand corner. This is what Pompeii looked like. Um, it looks like an Italian city looks today. Um, it looks very modern. Uh, and a lot of the um, houses had gardens and terraces and places for their horses. Of course, it was wealthier people lived there, um, or there were like vacation rentals there um, where people could stay and be served. Um, you know, if, it's really the same like when we are like, let's rent a villa in the Tuscan countryside. Um, it's similar to that. It's like, let's, let's get an Airbnb. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, that was the culture here. They didn't really have hotels. They just had people that had property that would like rent it out to you um, if you wanted to take a vacation there. Um, and then they also had a large population of Pompeii were the like servants. Yes, Roman Empire had servants and definitely had slaves. Um, and so naturally being in the high-end vacation town, um, there was a population of people um, who were servants and slaves. And the slaves um, were basically, you know, anybody that was against the Roman Empire, that they, uh, when they would take over villages, if there were like war, what they would call a war criminal, um, even people that get captured, really anybody. Anybody could have been taken slave, depending on their, um, you know, how they uh, <laughs> responded to being overtaken by the Roman Empire. Um, so, moving on. Well, <laughs> um, so 
Pompeii has a volcano and it's still there. It's still just as dangerous. Um, but in about 80, let me see if I can go back. Um, in about 80 common era, uh, it exploded or it erupted and it was the worst like volcanic eruption that we have on record. Um, and it covered the entire village of Pompeii and about six feet of ash and lava that immediately hardened. And so what we, <laughs> what we have, what you see in these images, are people who were, those are the positions they were in. They were like, it's basically they were frozen in time without having any warning. It went off, hot liquid um, basically froze their body to stone immediately froze it made it created this like stone around their body and then the stone only thickened with the more magma and lava that hardened and so we have these casts of human bodies there's not a full human body in there okay that part's not the person inside is deteriorated <laughs> it's basically a hollow cast of human bodies <laughs> um and if you've ever uh, seen any um, you know, popular sculpture that comes out of Italy, um, I, and, you know, I, should have, I have a sculpture at home. Um, a lot of the, the sculptures take on the same type of look and form. Um, and uh, so there are a few ruins of Pompeii that didn't get totally obliterated. And um, a lot of the people, like I said, were um, servants and slaves. So they didn't live in this like high-end ritzy area. They actually came from far away. Their village and living areas did not get obliterated. <laughs> so it definitely separated families. I mean, think you are at home and your spouse goes into Pompeii to work for the day so you're safe, you're totally fine, and then Pompeii just disappears under ash. Um, and the smoke and the residual air quality was killing everybody, so um, a lot of people were able to escape. And there's even a children's book called Escape from Pompeii, which is what you see in the upper left-hand corner, and it's the story about a family um, and who were able to escape a lot of people were just like getting on boats, getting on anything, swimming, just getting into the water, because um, it was really their only safe bet um, for physical protection at the time. Um, but that a volcano still is there, and it's still just as much as a threat. It never went away. It just like it's not just history. Um, and similarly to. Um, the fault line uh, in our country and the West that we, you know, call like the next big one um, that it's going to cause a tsunami and wipe out like Seattle and everything. Um, this, they have this volcano and it's supposed to erupt within the next hundred years in a similar way that it did during the Roman Empire. Um, but it wiped Pompeii out. Pompeii no longer exists. Um, now it's Naples. But it is probably the most significant event of the Roman Empire. Um, it happened like in the middle, middle of the Roman Empire. Um, and it was really significant because it was the wealthiest area around. Um, and it just, it only was Pompeii too. It like, just like stayed right in that little area. And, Everything else was fine. Um, so we mentioned the transportation routes. People would come in to Pompeii from other areas. Um, and you saw in that boat, um, in that children's book, that they had a lot of goods. And being a wealthy area, um, Pompeii was an important stop on trade routes. So in the upper right here you see a list of materials that the Italian Empire directly used, especially lapis. Um, 
and silk is one of the big ones on here that's not here this is mostly um like uh, rocks and minerals, um, mining type of things that came out of Asia that were imported by the Roman Empire. Um, imported significantly that the Chinese Empire was able to grow and grow and grow as they kept churning out these exports. And they developed all of these routes. And uh, we know this today as the Silk Road. You might have you know, heard about that, but it was one of the first times where two large empires created trade agreements. Um, and it was the onset of globalization. These routes still exist today, by the way. So here's even um, more evidence. This is an older map, which is why it says 80. Um, but you can really see the economy. So now we're talking about cost, revenue, entertainment, infrastructure. We're like really seeing government happening here. Um, and you can see where different uh, goods were found. And so they exploited their own empire as well. Um, but they also, they, so they would make like money off of, you know, the places that they would um, try to like, overtake. Uh, and so the Silk Road. <laughs> um, silk is a really popular material during the Roman Empire. Um, up until then, we don't have evidence of silk coming into like Western society until now. And the Silk Road does still exist. This is still a trade route for um, Chinese goods, not just silk, but it is called the Silk Road. Um, and in fact, there are even tourist events where you can ride camels in parts of the Silk Road and get the experience of you know, being a, like a transporter or somebody working the trade. Um, so it's just really um, incredible. In the upper left-hand corner, um, you might see something called One Belt, One Road. So this is really important because this map was made just a few years ago. And it's showing the interpretation of these routes. And of course, imports and exports have changed slightly and we have different transportation methods. Um, but China is still just as powerful and more powerful than the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire does not exist anymore. The Chinese Empire does. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on because this is a, a super relevant issue in society right now. Um, but the Silk Road is a really important part of design history because it is where all of materials as we know it came from. So when you think about when the US was settled um, in like the 1500s, 1600s, um, and as you know, the US became more settled and had more money and more wealth, we were able to import more goods. And this is how they would come. <laughs> so we weren't importing, I mean, yeah, we did import some things from Great Britain, but Great Britain imported them from somewhere else originally as well, um, which Constantina knows. <laughs> uh, shout out to Constantina. <laughs> um, so speaking specifically of silk, so in the upper left-hand corner, um, this is a popular image on artwork, painted furniture. We see this today, it's a motif essentially, um, but it is a depiction in a similar way that we would look at the Roman women below it. Um, and they actually were the togas that we associate with the Roman Empire, the styles. Um, that was the drapery of the silk, basically. And that was directly, the material itself not only came from China, but the style and how it was draped came from China. Granted, it did you know, adjust over time, and so it does have a slightly different uh, look, but it is not a Roman um, 
thing. Like it's a Chinese thing. <laughs> um, everything that we can find, like we talked about with like medicine and um, like the bathhouses, all these different cultural aspects. Um, China was doing that too, even more so. And that is an interesting research topic is how much um, <laughs> theft happened or was documented in the Roman Empire that we associate these things with the Roman Empire and not with China. So much that we study the Roman Empire and not necessarily um, Eastern uh, history or Chinese, the Chinese Empire or empires over time. Um, there's this book, this is a contemporary book. It's about the trade and exchange um, between Rome and China. And on the right hand side, we see some um, actual textiles from the Roman Empire <laughs> um, time. Uh, these are like actual silk fabrics and the actual patterns and the type of colors that were popular. Um, and so the way that we see them in images, you might not, uh, like the silk wasn't like it is today where it's highly processed and smooth and like butter. The silk was still very soft and strong and durable natural fiber, but um, the method that they created the silk was very different than how we do it today, obviously, because we have factories um, and, you know, we have different types of farming for silkworms. Um, but at the time, it was like an art form and there were so many different textures and types. We still have that. They're just not as well known. Um, when we think of silk, we don't think of things like this in the right hand picture. But silk wasn't the only thing that we have today. So the Roman Empire was hot for herringbone. Um, herringbone was everywhere. And it all started because of their civil engineering. And you can see that in the upper left-hand corner. They used any type of stone or rock. And they made herringbone roads because they were the strongest and they lasted the longest. Um, and so naturally they used herringbone and foundations of structures in walls. Um, you can see herringbone in this upper right hand corner running straight down the street. Um, this is a contemporary photo of a village in Italy. Um, even though uh, the street is in pretty great shape, um, but I'm willing to bet it was reconstructed based, you know, still historically significant, but they updated it. Um, probably with even more um, like infrastructure and uh, engineering. Um, herringbone became popular with higher end materials like marble. Um, and that's where like the onset of these tiles came from. And granted, these tiles are being imported, but we do associate them <laughs> with this specific culture. And herringbone was, not only was it so strong for infrastructure, but it was also strong in clothing. <laughs> so in the bottom right hand corner, this there is actually a store that sells um, like Roman inspired men's clothing. And this is a model for them. Um, and he's modeling some of their clothes and up close, it's all herringbone. And we think of herringbone almost as a pattern, but um, it's more or less the structure of the garment itself. Um, and you can see in the middle here that is the an original piece of herringbone garb that this man is wearing the contemporary version of. Does look really strong. Um, and we, of course, still have that today. Um, a lot of men's sportswear is made out of herringbone, um, not so much women's clothing to the same extent um, because there was some like genderization <laughs> of herringbone and silk um, over time um, that wasn't just a natural occurrence that was very specific um, because the gender roles in society required them to do different things so men needed clothing that you know could protect them from the elements and women 
did not need that <laughs> as much. Um, but herringbone, this, and here's another part of Roman culture, jails. Yes, they prisoned so many people, and their jails still exist today, and they are creepy as hell. <laughs> um, so in the right-hand photo, you can see a drawing, a simulation, like a recreation of herringbone structure and how they were used to create these domes because most of their jails were domes. Um, that looks like it's one floor, but in actuality, this dome would be anywhere from three to six or more stories high. And each floor would be a different like cell, maybe one or two cells. And there would be just this like staircase that goes up along the perimeter and the staircase you can see this was where the staircase would come in the staircase is extremely tight maybe like 18 inches wide um, and so this is where prisoners were kept and uh, this hole that you see here that is the restroom so <laughs> um, it would essentially connect to the cell below it and then go all the way down. Um, and this was the, this is like a really generous sized window. A lot of the times there just wasn't natural daylight and it would be like real, fully enclosed. So I've been in some of these jails and I am claustrophobic. So it just like wasn't a good place for me, but also the stairwell itself, unless you're like, a 10 year old skinny little kid like it's a terrible experience <laughs> i am getting anxiety thinking about it <laughs> um especially since it smells and like it's not cleaned it's not like um a recreation like it's like the actual thing <laughs> and it's scary thinking about the prisoners being brought up and down in those you know thinking about that experience as you actually walk through it yourself is terrifying and stand in the space and just experience it. Um, and there's a lot of inscriptions on the stones that are just like really scary and terrible. Um, but jails were a huge part of Roman culture as they, you know, needed to take over so many societies that they had a lot of um, people in captivity. So it was either this or you could be a slave. Um, I don't know, you pick. Maybe that'll be a question on the discussion board. What would you pick? <laughs> um, a lot of the women ended up in jails, actually. So let's talk a little bit more about physical therapy. <laughs> um, here's this bed again, but we also see um, there was a special type of money used, and these are some coins. Uh, so I guess this is like the Roman Empire of health, like version of health insurance. <laughs> So people were, like the government would give people coins and they looked like this and you could cash them in for medical services. Um, that would be interesting if we did that today. If we had the same like, <laughs> government gives you so much, you know, allowance for sex work. Um, we probably have a much happier society. Uh, <laughs> probably a lot less um, poverty and uh, but you know, then again, like we, we see sex work in a derogatory way, but they saw it as like, you know, a life or death, like you're giving me therapy, you're fixing my problems. Um, and you know, I don't, I don't know the science of it, if um, there's truth in the actual medicine of that, or if it was more of the like, um, the, uh, what's that um, word called for like a sugar pill? where you, it's like mental, they think, so it helps. Whatever, it doesn't really matter. If it worked, it worked. And if people enjoyed it, they enjoyed it. There's no evidence of a lot of sexual brutality unless you were in a jail in, uh, like, or a prisoner or something like that. Um, but people did get paid and it provided jobs to people to be physical therapists. But we can see evidence of this in other areas. We might not really notice it. So um, in the upper right, we'll just go from the upper right down, um, you see a bunch of 
it looks like just women playing volleyball really it, honestly it could look like they got a photo taken on the beach <laughs> um, but they those this is like an inscription that you would find in one of these um, structures one of these buildings essentially um, and so there are a lot of different things and it, it's not just sex work like it was just um, treating the body and understanding um, like our human body. Um, and then below this, you can see that there's, um, this looks like a full adult, just a smaller one, but really it's a child. Well, not like a child. I don't wanna get that impression. It's a younger person. <laughs> really, what, like this, this is not, I guess pedophilia did happen. It was culturally different at the time. Um, but I'm really just using this to show that it wasn't just, uh, women and men engaging, women and women, men and men, multiples. There were no like rules. Like you could see in the um, uh, sculpture below it, like a formal um, group therapy session. Um, and then on the far left, it's just some more evidence um, of ruins, and this this was like ruins of one of these locations. So you can see that the columns and that important emphasis, it wasn't like low end situation. This was like really dignified, important part of their culture. So much that they have money for it. I just find that fascinating. So. Let's talk about the Schwitz. <laughs> um, the Schwitz is a Detroit bathhouse. Um, it dates back to 1930 when it opened as um, an urban health club. Um, and in the 1930s, uh, cult in, in Detroit, um, it was, <laughs> um, you know, Detroit was, is, was booming at the time. This was before um, serious redlining took place in post-World War II, white flight, and all of that took place. But the society still wasn't super friendly to homosexuality. So bathhouses started um, happening. Like the Schwitz is a long-lasting bathhouse. Um, and these images are actual images from the inside. It's been you know, updated, but this is what it looked like and it provided a private club for people to come on specific nights where they could safely engage in their own type of therapies um, and they had different types of therapies you can see there's a pool there's social areas there was a little bit of a bar there was a sauna um, a lot of different things um, so today, I mean, and then it's the building, you know, over time, you can see the outside of it is this gray building with the blocked in windows. Um, it had, you know, run down naturally. Um, it's, it's downtown, but it is like not in a great area. And it's not like right downtown where the tall buildings are. Um, it's kind of like right on the outskirts um, on the, uh, east side of the city um, and so now it's back the Schwitz is back it still is a safe place it's a membership um, club um, it's the only bathhouse left in the city um, you can go to it I mean you it you don't have to have like a monthly membership you can drop in um, still offers the very best in ancient heat therapies and holistic healing. Take that for what it is. Um, great food and camaraderie, restorative stay. Um, yeah, so it's using the rhetoric of spas. Spas that maybe we don't think we would get like um, sex acts done, like, <laughs> but um, this is just a place where people can be people without um, you know, feeling like their safety is in jeopardy or they're going to get in trouble um, for, I don't know, public nudity or something. But it's really interesting. It's open um, right now. You can go to it. They have themed nights. 
they have a website they have social media of course it's all private you don't you don't actually they don't show pictures or anything um, but yeah if anybody's in Detroit and you're interested in going to it I would recommend it so before I before I move on to the next slide um, one thing that we do know uh, came you know from Roman and Greek culture was mythology and they had a lot of like um, you know sexual gods and goddesses um, sex and sensuality was a large part of their mythology and you can see how like going to a bathhouse was almost a religious experience and the Romans weren't religious at the time that word like it wasn't a thing there wasn't organized religion um, they were very secular which means that they weren't religious or they you know believed in multiple gods and there was nothing forced on people um, they believed what they believed and mythology to them was um, you know either it, they could have uh, known that it would be like faith-based <laughs> like oh this didn't really happen but it's fun to believe and it's kind of spiritual to believe or some people did believe it and who knows who knows do we have evidence that this did not happen <laughs> um, so we do we do see a lot of mythology coming out of the Roman Empire um, we consider it Greek you know Greek mythology um, but you might be thinking, um, if we're if this Roman Empire lasted from uh, five like you know five hundred years BCE up until the fifteen hundreds, didn't Jesus exist during that time? And if you look at the Roman Empire's land and like their territory, didn't didn't that overlap? <laughs> There's some overlapping here, like. Where is the story coming from? There's like two different things going on here. So um, there, there was, and we don't learn about the overlap. We learn like, and look in your textbook, because we'll learn here's the Roman Empire, and then the next, um, the next chapter is about Christianity in the Byzantine era. Um, but things just weren't like that clean. Um, it, it, like, <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that in our next slide. We're going to get into what happened when religion and faith, like organized beliefs that uh, went against like the mythology and like multiple gods um, happened. Like what, what happened with the people? Um, what happened with the Roman Empire and like the society and the territories um, yeah it's so let's let's get into a little bit more of what happened to the Roman Empire today on top of this because that is probably one of these lamp posts so this is the top you can take in your you know concert but then you want to go underground for a while and you go past this concierge figure <laughs> and uh, they made it look like a proper museum but you know I think it could be like you know a bathhouse situation here's the second place entry these renderings are beautiful too I love the style um, I, per I specifically love this um, and how they're using color in in their design and you can see they've used different types of stairs what I would be interested in is how some of these designers uh, approached universal design and maybe for the sake of the competition they only produced conceptual renderings and they didn't really get into that um, but experience like having something that is using the architecture of ruins like this could be a very inaccessible experience to people with mobility issues or even um, claustrophobia <laughs> or perhaps lineage that dates back to Pompeii 
Here's another, the third place. Again, beautiful renderings. Um, this is cool. They've made it into what looks like a lecture hall. So now that it looks like they're dividing the spaces up in the colonnades, um, using them. I like the way of directing light into the space. Like those look like spotlights um, that you would see in a theater like this, but that is natural sunlight, which actually is a uh, an Italian method of design then and now because it does get so hot and pretty. This this is a similar. Um, design concept anywhere where it's hot there's um, open large open areas so you can feel the exterior you can get the air but it is still hot in in your living area you don't want that heat to come with you so they do have some really closed off spaces that are dark and they have very specific locations for their openings for light um, so they thought about light and shadow for their own comfort, not just for aesthetics. And then here are some special mentions. And I included a link here. This, if you click it, it will take you to the article, which you know elaborates more on the competition and shows more images um, of everything. We will move on. Um, so this is a formal museum. It's the Barcelona City History Museum, Barcelona. Now we're in Spain. Um, and basically they put in um, like walkways that go right over the ruins um, so you can experience them. This is a formal museum meant for you to look at the ruins as opposed to experience them. Now you're looking at them as ruins, not as architecture. So that's, that's an interesting experience. Um, these are just pictures from the museum's website. There's a lot more online. They have a social media. Um, but here's a link if you want to go and read a little bit more. And then here, <laughs> so this, there is like, this is really awesome, and this is just one instance of things that happen in Italy today. Um, this is in Volterra, Italy. These images are from TripAdvisor. <laughs> um, I didn't take any photos of these. I was here, and it's, a, it's like a crazy experience. Um, so there was this vegan cafe that wanted to go in to this small Tuscan town, and as they were building, they uncovered ruins that had never been uncovered before. And it's against the law to build on ruins or, you know, destroy ruins. Um, so they own the land, they wanted to develop the restaurant, they've invested so much. They just made a glass floor over them, they put some lights down there, and they called it a day. This is common. That's how many, like, ruins there are. Um, and we think about ruins as like, oh, these are ancient ruins. What's really ancient ruins? We couldn't even fathom. We're only able to see these because we're so close in time to them. You know, we have contemporary life living alongside these quote unquote ruins. Um, we're essentially in the same time period, basically, in the grand scheme of the timeline of the world. So here's more information. Their TripAdvisor. These are all photos from TripAdvisor. Um, they don't really have a huge website. They are not like well known as like, you know, go see this, you know, um, ruins in this restaurant, which we would think is really cool, but it's very typical. Um, so I just wanted to show an example of just everyday life um, when you are living alongside um, Roman ruins. So let's get back to the Silk Road because there's something really contemporary happening right now um, that dates right back to the Silk Road that we talked about when they were importing uh, materials into you know, the Roman Empire um, area. Um, so this article was posted a few years ago 
Um, and China has been working on what they're calling a polar silk road. Basically, <laughs> what it is, is because the ice um, sheets are melting, China is, is, is now has access to go north, um, up past Russia, and um, so if you're over here, this is China, um, they, this is Russia, um, they can easily go right into some of these straits that used to be glaciers in like solid ice sheets, but now um, they are making transportation routes. They're taking advantage of um, global warming, essentially, which from a business point of view, it, you know, it, that's how we ha we're going to have to think about the future is how can we survive global warming's here, it's happening. What are we going to do about it? Um, and this is how China became the power that we know it today. During the Roman Empire, they mined, they maximized their um, exports, and now they're doing it again. They have more access to other parts of the, gro the globe um, through means that had never existed before. So click here to listen to this um, report from the World website. So basically, do you remember when Donald Trump said he wanted to buy Greenland? <laughs> it was, I don't know, oh, maybe two years ago now? It feels like yesterday. I probably mentioned it, but um, Greenland obviously said we're not for sale. But be he wanted to do that because um, there is, a like a group of countries that have come together that all have Arctic, um, you know, relations. Um, they're all touch the Arctic area, and the U.S. is one of them. Um, and so, China now wanting to come into the Arctic um, drew a lot of concerns in this group of people um, who see their job as to protect the Arctic and make, um, ex you know, decisions as a group. Um, and so uh, <laughs> Greenland is an untapped resource. They have like the highest amount of uranium in the world. And right now China is really the only exporter of uranium. So if they were to um, industrialize Greenland, they would monopolize uranium and other uh, materials, minerals. Um, but uh, Greenland, and this this will explain it a little bit in um, this recording. Um, you can, in the PDF, you can click and it will link you there. You can click here and it will link you there. And then there's a link at the end of this lecture. Um, Greenland is struggling. Um, obviously, climate change is affecting them. It's mostly Inuits um, who live off the land and have a very modest life, but now are finding trouble um, economically, supporting their families. Um, so what we're seeing is most, a lot of people are moving to their like metro uh, city, which is Nuuk. Um, and that's their basically, had, you know, that's their capital. That's where the most amount of people live in Greenland. Um, and so they're starting to get a little bit of a city there, like a little industrialized city. And China wants to use all of these people who need jobs and want work <laughs> and all of the land that they know, like the back of their hand, and have them start mining. And that's you know, why Trump was like, that's a great idea. Um, we should do that. <laughs> Let's buy Greenland. <laughs> um, but China has a better uh, chance of working with the Inuits than the US does. This is an ongoing political situation. Um, and actually, this recording happened just a few days ago. It's very, very contemporary. So. China's Silk Road is phenomenal. It is a podcast series 
Um, they have six episodes right now, starting from the China Dream all the way down to China's Arctic Ambition. And it goes uh, through different um, points in time and their relationships with different parts of the globe and how they've been able to essentially dominate um, culture, economy, everything throughout time. But we never really study that from a design history point of view. And so we're gonna start looking at that. Um, so your homework <laughs> is to listen, and these are not long podcasts, listen to these because it will, we, you know, we really focused on this, uh, the Silk Road, Italy and Europe, um, but they will talk about um, Kazakhstan and Central Asia, um, Eastern Asia, now we're getting in South America, <laughs> um, and now the Arctic. And so it really is a timeline of China's reign on the globe, that as far we have documented. Um, and so I think, and it's, it's actually very contemporary. This series is happening now. Like episode seven will probably be published next week. Um, or if it's not already by the time you're listening to this. Um, so it, I think it's really, really critical as we study design history and you know, as we source all of these materials as designers, that we understand our role in um, the Roman Empire and in the Chinese Empire, we'll call it the China Chinese Empire, um, as just like an umbrella term um, for the great power that is. <laughs> um, and we are we are in that. We don't know that we are. It doesn't. You know, we don't think that we are a part of this, but we really are. And it's not just us wearing clothes made in China. It's way, 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 way deeper than that. And as designers, we should really be more aware of this really um, deeply rooted history and the, like, the cultural impacts that um, Eastern culture and Chinese culture has had on Western culture way more than the other way around. We do not even realize that um, because we study uh, design from a Western canon. Um, <laughs> so it's really great that uh, there's some um, contemporary discourse on um, Eastern history as it directly relates to uh, you know the <laughs> yesterday, today, and tomorrow, essentially. So here's, here's what's next on our plate as a class. So your first task is to listen to the world report, which was that um, when we talked about uh, the US having a reaction to China's Arctic conquest. Um, and then listen to episodes one through six on the China's New Silk Road series. And then there will be a discussion board posted on Monday that asks questions about um, the reading mixed with some of these listenings in this lecture. Um, the discussion board will be ongoing, so I do not expect you to listen to all of these and read and take in this lecture like super fast. Um, so even down here I wrote the estimated next lecture upload will be October 25 so that's you can kind of time out how much time you have where we're going to be talking about um, this topic and it will start to go past um, the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire it's going to expand much much more um, so not only participate in the discussion, um, the proposal for your stories um, is due uh, Friday. Um, Brooke reminded me to put a Dropbox up and I told her I would do it and I just am now <laughs> remembering that I didn't do it. <laughs> um, I had class when I read that email, so. <laughs> um, so after I post this, I'm gonna do that, I promise. <laughs> Um, so turn in your proposal there. You can just put it on a Word doc and submit it there because I will open it and I'll just write back to you in the Word doc. Um, but also we haven't really talked in a while and so I'd love to catch up with everybody and talk about life and your research and ideas. Um, 
I know everybody is just like thrilled about this project and creating this history book. So I know like you can't even hide your excitement. Um, so I will d start a discussion board where we can talk about which days would work best to me. We can, you know, multiple days since everybody might not be available on the same day. Speaking of everybody being available, um, I made this announcement two weeks ago, maybe even more. Um, t tomorrow, Friday, is the germs and design uh, guest presentation. This is a uh, required part of your class. It is originally this was a guest presentation that we were going to have just for our class, um, but it has been opened up because there's been so much interest in it. So now it's a part of the Lemonade series. Um, so register on Eventbrite. Um, only registered uh, people will receive the Zoom link to watch it live. So if you plan on watching it live, which I really hope you do, and I made this announcement two weeks ago, so you would know to you know, save the date, um, register. There's only been, I think, like two or three people um, from class, from our class, that have registered. So um, I'm kind of curious what's going on. Um, I haven't heard anybody asking me questions about not being able to make it. Um, so I just really hope that everybody um, registers to get the Zoom link and um, be able to get credit because you will have an assignment related to this presentation. Um, the next lecture will be discussing topics from chapters three and four. Um, and we're gonna elaborate more on Christianity's impact on the Roman Empire and religion in general to secular societies. And also, of course, we're gonna have to look at um, Christianity and uh, Islamic and Asian culture. Um, in addition to design influences from yesterday, today, and tomorrow, um, or maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> Did Western society influence Islamic and Asian cultures like we just assume it did? I don't know. You'll have to find out. <laughs> um, so read chapters three and four. Chapter three covers the early Christian, Byzantine, and Romanesque um, era, which is basically the end of the Roman Empire when, you know, Jesus entered the equation. Um, and then read chapter four, which talks about Islamic and Asian traditions. They've just, you know, taken all of that and just put it in one chapter to, to uh, tidy that up nicely. So, um, but there's a lot of overlap and there's a lot of uh, discussion to be had. And will it all come back to the Silk Road? Well, we'll have to find out. I leave you with this image, <laughs> which is, um, the Arctic Council. So it's a representative from all of the countries in the Arctic Council. Um, we have, I think it's um, Mike Pompeo, who uh, the world in that um, episode, he is talking about it. The most previous Arctic Council meeting in China, wanting to become a part of the Arctic Council. Um, so that's interesting, but you know, all of these powers are coming together to like take over this untapped land. What does that sound like? <laughs> Is this the new empire? Are these the new leaders? <laughs> Is this the, like a new gang in town? Um, really interesting looking gaggle. I'm not really sure, like, the people in the top row are like normal looking right at the camera, and then the people in the middle are like also normal looking right at the camera, but the two guys on the end in the front row, I'm not really sure what's going on there. Um, such a good picture, but, you know, maybe they like it, like moved out of it or something, but um, yeah, I leave you with, this image and um, I can't wait to read your proposals and talk to you more about your life, um, 
how the semester is going for you, how life is going for you, um, what you think about all of this, if you think column styles are a bunch of BS. <laughs> I'm sure I pissed somebody off. Um, <laughs> although column styles were a topic, or was a topic on the uh, project list, nobody signed up for us, so. <laughs> all right, I hope you guys are good, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.